Hello friends, I am Dr. Ankit Goel and today we will discuss the psychiatric questions of Grand Test 182 with multiple type answers that is PGI type questions we will discuss today. So let us discuss the first question. So the first question is features of delusion are A. Shakeable B. True belief C. False belief D. Bizarre and E. Non-bizarre. So the answer to this question is So the answer for question 201 are C, it's a false belief, then D, it can be a bizarre delusion, delusion can be bizarre and E can also be non-bizarre. So let us discuss about important concept of delusion. Delusion is a disorder of content of thought. Important to remember that it is a disorder of the content of thought. Now, what is delusion? Now, delusion is a false, unshakable. So delusion is a false and unshakable. Unshakable means it is very firm. It is a fixed idea or belief. So it's a false and unshakable idea or belief which is out of keeping with persons social, cultural and educational background. So it is out of keeping with a person's social, cultural or educational background. For example, if a community or a culture believes that if a black cat crosses their way, it is something mis misfortune is going to happen. So it is not out of keeping with someone's cultural belief. So hence it is not a delusion. While delusion should be out of keeping with person's social, cultural and educational background. And it should be held, it should be held with extraordinary conviction. So the person is extraordinarily convinced that whatever the belief or the idea is, it is true and with subjective certainty. So for that person, that belief or idea is definitely a certainty. So for example, if a person believes that his neighbors are trying to harm him, although the other people try to convince him otherwise that it is not true. There is no evidence to support this idea or belief. But still the person is still saying that no, the person or the neighbors are trying to harm him. So hence he is extraordinarily convinced and has a subjective certainty. So these are all the important features of a delusion. So it is a false and unshakable idea or belief important to remember. Now the most common delusion is delusion of persecution. So delusion of persecution is the most common delusion. Now coming to the concept of bizarre and non-bizarre. Now this concept was described in DSM-4 TR. But now this concept has been removed from DSM-5. Still, in DSM-4-TR, if a person would have bizarre delusion, so this was considered as one of the important criteria for schizophrenia. So there was an importance given to the 
bizarre delusion as a symptom. But now that criteria or that importance has been removed from DSM-5. Still, we should understand or should know what is the concept of bizarre and non-bizarre delusion. Now, bizarre delusions These are the delusions which are scientifically impossible. So these are delusions which are scientifically impossible and culturally implausible. So these are scientifically impossible and culturally implausible. For example, if a person says that there are aliens on Mars who came and inserted a chip in their mind and now there are, they are following the activities of the person sitting on Mars. So this, is, this seems to be a scientifically implausible concept. So these, this, such type of delusions are known as bizarre delusions and sometimes even asked in the questions that you have to tell which is a bizarre or a non-bizarre delusion. So this is bizarre delusion. Then what is a non-bizarre delusion? Now, non-bizarre delusions are delusions which although are false but are possible. So, for example, we discussed that a person is saying or claiming that the neighbors want to harm him. Although this is false, but still it may be possible. So, this scenario is not, is not that it cannot be possible. Another example, a person saying that my partner or my spouse is infidile or is cheating behind my back or is having an affair. Again, this may be false, but again, this can be a possibility. So, such type of examples are of non-bizarre delusions. So, important to understand the concept of bizarre delusions and non-bizarre delusions. Now, let us discuss the next question, question 202. Features of schizophrenia are A. First rank symptom is helpful in making diagnosis. B. Depression may be present. C. Brain ventricle enlargement may be present. D. Onset occur only after age of 40 years and E. Usually onset occur later in women as compared to men. So the correct answer in this questions are A. That is first rank symptom is helpful in making a diagnosis. B. Depression again may be present. C. Ventricle enlargement may be present. Again that is again true. And E. That is usually the onset occur later in women than in men. So correct answers are A, B, C and E. So let us discuss the question in detail. So as we have discussed, the correct answer is option A, B, C and E. Now let us discuss about schizophrenia. When we discuss schizophrenia nowadays, now the symptoms may be divided into various domains. So let us discuss the various domains in which the symptoms of schizophrenia may be defined. Now first important domain is the positive symptoms. So the first important domain is the positive symptoms which include delusions, and hallucinations. So delusions as we had already discussed it's a fixed form, it's a firm or unshakable idea or belief while hallucinations are false perception without any stimulus. So these are these both are included under the positive symptoms. Then the next domain which is discussed is the negative symptoms. Now, 
Now, important negative symptoms described under schizophrenia include anhedonia, which is in fact the most common negative symptom which is seen in schizophrenia. Then other negative symptoms include evolution that is lack of motivation or lack of will to do any act. Then affect blunting then apathetic social withdrawal also sometimes known as asociality that is the person is not involved in social relationships and last is alogia there is decrease in the verbal output or verbal production so these are important five negative symptoms which are seen in schizophrenia so these are two important domains then few other domains which are nowadays also described is the affective symptoms yes even the mood or the affective symptoms can also be seen for example depression mania or hypomanic symptoms these all can also be seen in schizophrenia although they should not be dominantly present otherwise we have to see what the diagnosis is so these may be present for some time then fourth is the cognitive symptoms so cognitive symptoms like difficulty in learning memory abstract thinking speed of verbal speed all those things again can now also be are described under few domains of schizophrenia and the last domain which is described is the disorganized or the aggressive symptoms so these may include formal thought disorder or bizarre behaviors disorganized behavior or also catatonic symptoms the catatonic symptoms these all motor symptoms are described under disorganized or aggressive symptoms so these are important five domains which are nowadays described for schizophrenia so important yes depression may be seen in schizophrenia then earlier schneiders first rank symptoms schneiders first rank symptoms were also described and given importance for describing schizophrenia again these also Schneider's first rank symptoms or the SFRS also hold importance and if present then again they, they are given importance in diagnosing of schizophrenia although they may not be mandatory if Schneider's first rank symptoms are not present still we can make a diagnosis of schizophrenia but yes these are also given importance then coming to the onset Now generally it is seen that the onset in males is by the age of 10 to 25 years while in females the peak onset is around 25 to 35 years. So yes in females the age of onset is more than in males. Also females may also have a bimodal peak of onset. So first peak may be at the age of around 25 to 35 years and the second peak may be in the fourth or the fifth decade. So this is about the onset in males and females regarding schizophrenia. Now 
another important point to remember is earlier schizophrenia was divided into type 1 and type 2. This classification was given by T.J. Crow. Now, according to this classification, now according to this classification in type 1, there were predominant positive symptoms and in type 2, there were predominant negative symptoms. Now, type 1 were treatment responsive while type 2 were generally treatment non-responsive that is type 1 would give show good response to the antipsychotics or the treatment used for the treatment while type 2 would give lesser or no response to treatment. In type 1 they would generally have a normal ventricle size while in type 2 there may be ventricle enlargement. So, in type 2, there may be ventricle enlargement may be seen. Now, type 1 would have a better prognosis while type 2 would show a poor prognosis. So, these are some of the important classifications or the criteria differentiating type 1 and type 2 which was given by described by T. J. Crow. Now hence we can easily make out yes ventricular enlargement may be seen in patients with schizophrenia although some may have a normal ventricle size. So this is the explanation of the second question. Now let us discuss the third question. The drug used for maintenance of bipolar disorder include which of the following is the drug which is used for the bipolar disorder. So options are A lithium, B venlafaxine, C imipramine, D carbamazepine or E divalproic. So the correct answer is option A that is lithium, option D that is carbamazepine and option E that is divalproic. So let us discuss. So, answer to question 203 is A, lithium, D, carbamazepine and E, divalprox. Now, in the maintenance treatment, the maintenance treatment of bipolar affective disorder. Now let us discuss what the latest guidelines have to say. So the latest Maudsley guideline for the treatment of maintenance in bipolar affective disorder states that the first line treatment for maintenance is lithium. Then the second line treatment includes valproate or the divalproic sodium and various antipsychotics like olanzapine, resperidone, then eripiprazole and cutiapine. So these are the important antipsychotics which may be used as second line treatment or treatment in the maintenance of bipolar affective disorder. Then the third line treatment may include carbamazepine, lamotrigine and luracidone. So these may be also be used as a third line treatment. Also in the third line, 
first generation antipsychotics may be used also although there is less evidence for the treatment but still they can be used or any antipsychotic which has been used or which has been effective for the management of acute symptoms again that can also be continued as a maintenance or the prophylaxis treatment for bipolar affective disorder so these are all important drugs which we should remember which can be used as prophylaxis or maintenance in treatment of bipolar affective disorders <coughs> now let us discuss the next question a 35 year old male comes with a history of 10 years of alcoholism or that is alcohol use and there is a past history of ataxia and bilateral rectus palsy he was admitted and treated what changes expected to see option a progression to korsakoff Kors psychosis option b residual ataxia in 50 percent of patients option c extraocular palsy disappears in hours and option d immediate relief for symptoms so the correct answer is option b that is residual ataxia in 50 percent of patients and c extraocular palsy disappears in hours so let us discuss what we are dealing with <coughs> answer to question 204 are option B and option C now the condition which we are dealing is Wernicke's encephalopathy <coughs> so the, op the concept which we will discuss is Wernicke's encephalopathy now generally this is described by a triad of symptoms of global confusion <coughs> ophthalmoplegia then it described by sixth cranial nerve palsy more than the third cranial nerve palsy and ataxia so and this can be remembered with the mnemonic go so this, this there is a triad of symptoms Wernicke's encephalopathy now all these symptoms may be seen together or may occur one after the other or in one patient all the three symptoms may not be present so there is a triad of symptom of global confusion of thalmoplegia and ataxia now generally what is the cause now generally it is seen when patients who use chronic who, who use alcohol chronically use alcohol they have thymine deficiency now this may be because of nutritional nutritional deficiency that the patient is not having adequate nutrition also this can be because of erosion of the, the epithelium or the GIT tract because of which there is poorer absorption of thymine so there is thymine deficiency and as we know that thymine is important cofactor in various enzymes like thymine pyrophosphate TPP then transketolase then in pyruvate dehydrogenase and also in alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase so it is an important cofactor in various enzymes which are used in Krebs cycle now because of the deficiency of thymine in such patient there is decreased utilization of of glucose subsequently there is accumulation of glutamate and subsequently the accumulation of glutamate leads to damage to the neurons because of the excitatory 
nature. So there is excitatory damage to the neurons, which subsequently lead to the various symptoms we had just described. Now, important areas of the brain, the important areas of the brain which are affected in Wernicke's encephalopathy include thalamus, mammillary bodies, then midline cerebellum, then periaqueductal gray matter of the midbrain, and also the peripheral nerves. So these are important areas of the brain which are affected and important to remember. So these are the important areas which are affected. Now generally it is seen, now tre for treatment it is supplementation of thymine which is important. Initially it may be given in parenteral form and subsequently after few days it may be given orally. Now, so thymine should be given and any such patient which comes to us in emergency we should always give glucose or dextrose along with thymine otherwise it may precipitate symptoms of Wernicke's encephalopathy. Now also it is seen that the ocular symptoms or the ocular paresis may improve within hours. So it is in fact one of the first symptoms to improve and also in some patients there may be residual ataxia. So the ataxia may in fact may not com completely improve for some time and in fact it may be as around 50 percent of cases residual ataxia may be present but although with time it may also improve. Generally it is said that the symptoms of Wernicke's encephalopathy are reversible. So these are reversible symptoms. Now if Wernicke's encephalopathy remains untreated, it may lead to what is known as Korsakoff psychosis. So it may lead to Korsakoff psychosis which is generally said to be irreversible. So generally the Korsakoff psychosis is irreversible and generally if Wernicke's encephalopathy is untreated, remain untreated for, for some time, it may lead to Korsakoff psychosis. Now let us discuss the next question. Not a feature of Alzheimer's disease, A, Hiranobodies, B, amyloid angiopathy, C, granulovacular degeneration of neurons, D, senile plaque or E, cerebellar atrophy. So the correct answer to question 205 is option E that is cerebellar atrophy. It is not cerebellar but cerebral atrophy which is seen in Alzheimer's disease. So let us discuss this in detail. So the answer is option E that is cerebellar atrophy. Now Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. Important. Now if we see macroscopically, so if we see macroscopically there is cerebral atrophy, there is cerebral atrophy especially in the temporal and the parietal region or the temporal or the parietal lobes and also the frontal lobe may be involved but importantly we need to remember the temporoparietal atrophy which is commonly seen in Alzheimer's disease. Then 
in the mi microscopic picture or in the microscopically if we see what all are the changes which are seen in Alzheimer's disease, there may be neuritic or the senile plaques so there may be neuritic or the senile plaques which may be seen now these have a central amyloid core so they have a central amyloid core which is surrounded by a halo so there may be neuritic plaques which can be seen then there also may be neurofibrillary tangles now these are cytoplasmic bodies which may also be seen again there may be amyloid angiopathy so there may be amyloid angiopathy may be seen as well as there may be granulo vacular degeneration again which are cytoplasmic vacuoles these may be seen as well as there may be rhino bodies which are eosinophilic bodies these again can also be seen now the most common neurochemical or the neurotransmitter which is deficient or deficit in Alzheimer's disease is important to remember is acetylcholine. So important to remember that the most common neurochemical which is deficient in Alzheimer's disease is acetylcholine. So these are some of the important points of Alzheimer's disease. Now coming to the next question, question 206. Psychosurgery not indicated in option A, intractable seizures, option B, suicidal depression, option C, severe depression not responding to medical treatment, option D, dysthymia and option E that is psychotic depression. So it is not used in, correct answer is option B, suicidal depression, then dysthymia and E psychotic depression. So let us discuss about the psychosurgery. So psychosurgery is not used in option B, D and option E. So these in the, the psychosurgeries are not used. So let us discuss about the psychosurgeries. Now what are the indications of psychosurgery? In psychosurgery, generally we are having lesion in some or the other part of the brain. So one or other part of the brain, there is some lesion being made. So this is psychosurgery. Now generally these are used, psychosurgery generally are used for patients who have a chronic, severe, debilitating illness and generally such illnesses should be more than one year and typically patients in which psychosurgeries are done generally they have symptoms which have which have been there for more than typically more than five years so then we think of psychosurgery as a treatment again patient in which all other methods or all other treatments either have failed or shown no significant response or were contraindicated. So the other modalities of treatment should have been used in the patient only then we use psychosurgery. So illnesses like depression, OCD, anxiety disorders. So in such illnesses we use which are chronic, severe, debilitating illness, typically illness occurring for more than five years, but generally more than one year. 
and all the other treatment modalities have failed or these are or some of the other modalities are contraindicated then we think of psychosurgery also these can also be used in intractable seizures seizures which are not controlled in such patients as well we can think of psychosurgery now important lesion procedures or psychosurgeries some of the important lesion procedures include first is subcordate tractotomy then there is anterior cingulotomy then third is limbic leucotomy now it is combination of 1 and 2 so limbic leucotomy then there is anterior an anterior capsulotomy or nowadays gamma knife capsulotomy so these are important some of the important lesion procedures which we may remember so again as we had discussed these are some of the important indications of the various psychosurgeries and these are some of the important procedures which may be used now let us discuss the next question to question 207 in catatonic schizophrenia which is not found now option a vaxi flexibility option b aut automatic obedience option c somatic passivity option d cataplexy and option e hallucination now the correct answer to this question is option d that is cataplexy now let us discuss about catatonic schizophrenia so question 207 the correct answer is option d cataplexy now before going discussing catatonic schizophrenia we should discuss what is catatonia now the term catatonia was described by carl ludwig kalbom in 1874 so it was kalbom who described the concept of catatonia now catatonia is a Uh, is a symptoms or is a symptoms of motor uh, dysfunctions or so there are motor function uh, symptoms are generally seen in catatonia so let us discuss some of the important clinical features of catatonia which may be multiple and it may not be necessary that all the symptoms should be present in each patient so uh, one patient may have some symptoms other patient may have some other different symptoms so let us discuss all the important clinical features of catatonia so there may be stupor stupor means there is no or decreased psychomotor activity then there may be mutism so there may be no or very little verbal output from the patient so person may be mute like we have muted the television so the person similarly may be showing mutism then there may be very different or opposite to stupor there may be marked agitation or there may be extreme excitement the patient may be severely agitated and there may be very significant increased psychomotor activity then other symptoms may include posturing a posturing is maintenance of spontaneous is spontaneous and active maintenance of posture against gravity 
so there is continuous and active maintenance of posture against gravity so the person himself has maintained that posture so for example a person may just make be standing for hours like this which he has maintained himself so this is posturing so it's a spontaneous and active maintenance of posture against gravity then similarly there may be symptom known as catalepsy now it is not cataplexy but catalepsy now what is catalepsy it is passive so it is passive induction of posture against gravity now in similarly now this same posture has been passively done by the examiner or someone else and the person is maintaining this posture so this posture now is passively induced to the patient by someone else and the patient now is maintaining this posture so this is catalepsy although it seem that posturing and catalepsy are similar terms or may be used interchangeably but this is the basic difference between posturing and catalepsy then there may be negativism in negativism the person generally resists whatever the person is told to do or what whatever the person is being made to do and sometimes when it becomes extreme it it is known as gagen holton so when it becomes extreme it is known as gagen holton so for example if a per, if an examiner is push, pulling the hand of the patient towards himself but the person now is resisting resisting so much so that now even he is using the force more than that of the examiner so this is gagen holton when he is resisting it e even with more force than that of the examiner so this is negativism then there may be term known as waxy flexibility so waxy flexibility means that the person may be molded like a wax so just like a wax candle if we mold it there is initial resistance and thereafter you can mold it as you want similarly in such patient the tone of the muscle is such that there is initial resistance and after that you can mold as what you want so this symptom this typical sign is known as waxy flexibility another important sign is automatic obedience so this is opposite of negativism in negativism as we know that the person was resisting now in automatic ab obedience the person will will imply whatever the examiner is saying even if the person will may be may get some harm still the person will be automatically being becomes obedient to whatever the person is being instructed to do so it may be again it may be a milder form known as mit mehan mit mehan now here despite being told the person still allows his body to be uh, shifted or body to be molded in different positions and if it becomes extreme it is known as mit gehen in mit gehen even a slight push from your fingers you just push the patient with your fingers slight pressure and the person may just comply to it and he may just fall down with a just a slight push so he is totally obedient to what the examiner is doing so that is mit gehen so this is the difference or this is a extreme form of automatic obedience then other symptoms include mannerism and stereotypy so mannerism and stereotypy both are both are odd movements both are odd repetitive spontaneous movements so mannerisms are generally purposeful 
or goal directed while stereotypies generally are non purposeful or non goal directed so this is the basic difference that although both are odd movements both are repetitive and spontaneous movements but mannerisms are movements which have some goal or which have some purpose while stereotypies may not have any purpose non -pur non purposeful and non goal directed for example a person doing this multiple times so although it is of some purpose but the person is doing it multiple time repeatedly so this is mannerism and certain movements like this which has no relevance and the person is doing rep repetitively so these are stereotypies so this is the important difference between mannerisms and stereotypies then another important symptom is grimacing so this is odd facial movements for example there may be puckering of the lips so this is a this is grimacing then other important symptoms are echolalia and echopraxia now in echolalia the patient is repeating the patient is repeating the words so whatever the examiner is saying so the patient is repeating so for example a, a patient the a client or the if a therapist ask a patient what is your name so the person will reply again what is your name so this is how the person is repeating the examiner or people around whatever they are saying the person is repeating that in echopraxia the person is repeating the actions so whatever the acts the, the examiner or people around him are doing the person will be repeating those acts so this is the important difference between uh, echolalia and echopraxia so these are important symptoms which are seen now echo now cataplexy in the option cataplexy and not catalepsy cataplexy this is a symptom seen in narcolepsy now this is sudden this is sudden brief this is a sudden brief loss of the voluntary muscle tone so there is a sudden loss of the voluntary muscle tone this is cataplexy which is seen in narcolepsy so this is not seen in catatonia now in this question we have discussed these are some of the features of catatonia now in catatonic schizophrenia although it is predominantly catatonic symptoms are seen but again other symptoms of schizophrenia like in the option somatic passivity or hallucinations now these again may be seen but generally to make a diagnosis of specifically catatonic schizophrenia the catatonic symptoms should be predominant and these may be seen transitarily or these may be seen in very transient phase so again hence the option the correct answer was cataplexy which is seen in narcolepsy so this is the answer now let us discuss the next option the question 208 treatment of opioid dependence include a naloxone b naltrexone c a camprosate d buprenorphine and e topiramate so the correct answer is option b naltrexone and option d buprenorphine so let us discuss so the answer is option b and d 
Now, if we discuss treatment of opioid, it may be divided into withdrawal treatment and maintenance. So, this may be divided into withdrawal and treatment and the maintenance treatment. Now, let us discuss the first is the withdrawal treatment. In the treatment of withdrawals, we have two approaches. The first is the opioid agents. So, here the opioid agents are used for treatment and second approach may be use of non-opioid agents. In the opioid agents, the various agents which we use for treatment include methadone, then buprenorphine, which important to remember is a partial agonist. It's a partial opioid agonist. Important to remember. Then third is the levo alpha acetyl methadol or LAAM. Generally, this is not used nowadays because of the cardiac side effects. Then also tramadol can also be used. So, these are some of the agents which are the opioid agents which are used in withdrawal state. Then the known opioid agents which may be used in the option as we discussed buprenorphine is one of the treatment modality now coming to the non opioid agents in this we have alpha 2 agonists like clonidine guanfacin now they generally decrease some of the uh, sympathetic symptoms like sweating nausea vomiting diarrhea these are generally used for decreasing these symptoms then there is another approach known as rapid detoxification so there is another important approach known as rapid detoxification in which generally the acute phase is decreased so if we use some opioid agent, generally it takes time for the treatment of the withdrawal or the acute phase. But to decrease that acute phase, what we give is that is or decrease the period of hospitalization, we give a antagonist like naltrexone. So along with agents to decrease the symptoms, for example, clonidine. So we give an antagonist. So we give an antagonist which precipitates the withdrawal symptoms. So there is early precipitation of withdrawal symptoms rather than waiting for the withdrawal symptoms to occur. And we give drugs which decrease the withdrawal symptoms. So this is rapid detoxification. Then another important modality is the ultra rapid detoxification. So it further, it, it is in fact, it decreases the the period of hospitalization even less but this is general, generally done in general anesthesia so there is a again large dose of antagonist are given so there is a large dose of antagonist given so along with the in, along with treatment of the withdrawal symptoms so commonly this is not used and generally if it is done it is done under general anesthesia important to remember so this is the important this is the uh, important steps for treatment of withdrawal symptoms in opioid use then in maintenance the maintenance symptom in the maintenance treatment either 
we use an antagonist like naltrexone. So we keep the patient on antagonist like naltrexone. So even if he consumes opioid, there will be no effect because of the re receptor being blocked by the antagonist naltrexone. Or sometimes we use a approach known as harm reduction approach. So we use an approach known as harm reduction approach, especially in patients who have tried to abstain from opioid multiple times, but there have been multiple relapses or those who are not able to stop uh, the use of uh, opioids. So we, we give is the harm reduction approach in which we use opioid substitution therapy. So rather the patient is using something uh, like SMAC which have a lot of impurities or the person is using injectables which may lead to various uh, illnesses like uh, there is maybe transmission of HIV, hepatitis. So rather than this we give a pure form of opioid. So this is known as harm reduction. We, is, we are reducing the harm of using various impurities or using injectable forms. So in this similarly agonist like methadone or buprenorphine can be used. So person is maintained on various uh, opioids like methadone or buprenorphine for a long time. So this is the important approach for the treatment of opioid use disorder. So this was about the psychiatric questions of the grand test 182. Thank you very much.